Don't you love the names of these chapters that Rick Riordan created? This chapter six title is I Became Become Supreme Lord of the Bathroom. As always, chapter five was discussed um, discussing a couple things that may have been very confusing. Percy had his first time walking around and getting to know people at Camp Half-Blood. Chiron was his little sidekick in that regard. He was teaching him certain things. He was like a mentor. And Grover, his good friend, was almost in trouble with Mr. D just because of how horrible things were with that bullfighting. Um, So here we are. This is chapter six. I become supreme lord of the bathroom. Once I got over the fact that my Latin teacher was a horse, we had a nice tour, though I was careful not to walk behind him. I'd done pooper scooper patrol in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade a few times. And I'm sorry, I did not trust Chiron's back end the way I trusted his front. We passed the volleyball pit. Several of the campers nudged each other. One pointed to the minotaur horn I was carrying. Another said, that's him? Most of the campers were older than me. Their satyr friends were bigger than Grover. All of them trotting around in orange camp half-blood t-shirts with nothing else to cover their bare shaggy hindquarters. I wasn't normally shy, but the way they stared at me made me feel uncomfortable. I felt like they were expecting me to do a flip or something. I looked back at the farmhouse. It was a lot bigger than I'd realized. Four stories tall, sky blue with white trim, like an upscale seaside resort. I was checking out the Brass Eagle weather vane on top when something caught my eye. A shadow in an uppermost window of the attic gable. Something had moved the curtain just for a second and I got the distinct impression I was being watched. What's up there? I asked Chiron. He looked where I was pointing, and his smile faded. Just the attic. Somebody lives there? No, he said with finality. Not a single living thing. I got the feeling he was being truthful, but I was also sure something had moved that curtain. Come along, Percy. Chiron said, his lighthearted tone now a little forced. Lots to see. We walked through the strawberry fields, where campers were picking bushels of berries while a satyr played a tune on a reed pipe. Chiron told me the camp grew a nice crop for export to New York restaurants in Mount Olympus. It pays our expenses, he explained, and the strawberries take almost no effort. He said Mr. D had this effect on fruit-bearing plants. They just went crazy when he was around. It worked best with wine grapes, but Mr. D was restricted from growing those, so they grew strawberries instead. I watched the satyr playing his pipe. His music was causing lines of bugs to leave the strawberry patch in every direction, like refugees fleeing a fire. I wondered if Grover could work that kind of magic with music. I wondered if he was still inside the farmhouse, getting chewed out by Mr. D. Grover won't get in too much trouble, will he? I asked Chiron. I mean, he was a good protector, really. Chiron sighed. He shed his tweed jacket and draped it over the horse's back like a saddle. Grover has big dreams, Percy perhaps bigger than reasonable. To reach his goal, he must first demonstrate great courage by succeeding as a keeper, finding a new camper, and bringing him safely to Camp Half-Blood Hill. But he did that. I might agree with you, Chiron said, but it's not my place to judge. Dionysus and the Council of Cloven Elders must decide. I'm afraid they might not see this assignment as a success. After all, Grover lost you in New York. Then there's the unfortunate uh, fate of your mother, and the fact that Grover was unconscious when you dragged him over the property line. The council might question whether this shows any courage on Grover's part. 
I wanted to protest. None of what happened was Grover's fault. I also felt really, really guilty. If I hadn't given Grover the slip at the bus station, he might not have gotten into trouble. He'll get a second chance, won't he? Chiron winced. I'm afraid that was Grover's second chance, Percy. The council was not anxious to give him another. Either, after what happened the first time, five years ago. Olympus knows. I advised him to wait longer before trying again. He's still so small for his age. How old is he? Oh, 28. What? And he's in sixth grade? Satyrs mature half as fast as humans, Percy. Grover has been the equivalent of a middle school student for the past six years. Imagine that, spending double the amount of time as a middle school student. Now there's another situation coming up where Percy asks a question over here, and Chiron looks away and purposely does not answer. Anyway, Percy's response about Grover's age of 28 and being in sixth grade for six years is this. That's horrible. Quite. Chiron agreed. At any rate, Grover is a late bloomer, even by satyr standards, and not yet very accomplished at woodland magic. Alas, he was anxious to pursue his dream. Perhaps now he will find some other career. That's not fair, I said. What happened the first time? Was it really so bad? Chiron looked away quickly. Let's move along, shall we? But I wasn't quite ready to let the subject drop. Something had occurred to me when Chiron talked about my mother's fate, as if he were intentionally avoiding the word death. The beginnings of an idea, a tiny, hopeful fire starting, started forming in my mind. Chiron, I said, if the gods in Olympus and all that are real, yes, child, does that mean the underworld is real? Two? Chiron's expression darkened. Yes, child. He paused, as if choosing his words carefully. There is a place where spirits go after death. But for now, until we know more, I would urge you to put that out of your mind. What do you mean, until we know more? Come, Percy, let's see the woods. As we got closer, I realized how huge the forest was. It took up at least a quarter of the valley, with trees so tall and thick, you could imagine nobody had been in there since the Native Americans. Chiron said, The woods are stocked. If you care to try your luck, but go armed. Stocked with what? I asked. Armed with what? You'll see. Capture the flag is Friday night. Do you have your own sword and shield? My own? No, Chiron said. I don't suppose you do. I think a size five will do. I'll visit the armory later. I wanted to ask what kind of summer camp had an armory, but there was too much else to think about. So the tour continued. We saw the archery range, the canoeing lake, the stables, which Chiron didn't seem to like very much, the javelin range, the sing-along amphitheater, and the arena where Chiron said they held sword and spear fights. Sword and spear fights? I asked. Cabin challenges and all that, he explained. Not lethal, usually. Oh, yes. And there's the mess hall. This summer camp sounds very adventurous. And he's explaining the mess hall, which is where everybody eats. Chiron pointed to an outdoor pavilion framed in white Grecian columns on a hill overlooking the sea. There were a dozen stone picnic tables. No roof, no walls. What do you do when it rains? I asked. Chiron looked at me as if I've gone a little weird. We still have to eat, don't we? I decided to drop the subject. Finally, he showed me the cabins. There were 12 of them, nestled, nestled in the woods by the lake. They were arranged in a U, with the base 
with two at the base and five in a row on either side, and they were without doubt the most bizarre collection of buildings I'd ever seen, except for the fact that each had a large brass number above the door. Odds on the left side, evens on the right. They looked absolutely nothing alike. Number nine had smokestacks like a tiny factory. Number four had tomato vines on the walls and a roof made out of real grass. Seven seemed to be made of solid gold, which gleamed so much in the sunlight it was almost impossible to look at. They all faced a commons area about the size of a soccer field, dotted with Greek statues, fountains, flower beds, and a couple of basketball hoops, which were more my speed. In the center of the field, was a huge stone-lined fire pit. Even though it was a warm afternoon, the hearth smoldered. A girl, about nine years old, was tending to the flames, poking the coals with a stick. The pair of cabins at the head of the field, numbers one and two, looked like his and hers mausoleums. Big white marble boxes with heavy columns in front. Cabin one was the biggest and bulkiest of the twelve. Its polished bronze door shimmered like a hologram, so that it, from different angles, lightning bolts seemed to streak across them. Cabin two was more graceful somehow, with slimmer columns garlanded with pomegranates and flowers. The walls were carved with images of peacocks. Zeus and Hera, I guessed. Correct, Chiron said. Their cabins look empty. Several of the cabins are. That's true. No one ever stays in one or two. Okay, so each cabin had a different god, like a mascot. Twelve cabins for the twelve Olympians. But why would some be empty? I stopped in front of the first cabin on the left, cabin three. It wasn't high and mighty like cabin one, but long and low and solid. The outer walls were a rough gray stone studded with pieces of seashell and coral, as if the slabs had been hewn straight from the bottom of the ocean floor. I peeked inside the open doorway and Chiron said, Oh, I wouldn't do that. Before he could pull me back, I caught the salty scent of the interior, like the wind on the shore at Montauk. The interior walls glowed like abalone. There were six empty bunk beds with silk sheets turned down, but there was no sign anybody has ever slept there. The place felt so sad and lonely. I was glad when Chiron put his hand on my shoulder and said, Come along, Percy. Most of the other cabins were crowded with campers. Number five was bright red nasty paint job, as if the color had been splashed on with buckets and fists. The roof was lined with barbed wire. A stuffed wild boar's head hung over the doorway, and its eyes seemed to follow me. Inside, I could see a bunch of mean-looking kids, both girls and boys, arm wrestling and arguing with each other while rock music blared. The loudest girl was maybe 13 or 14. She wore a size extra, extra, extra large camp half-blood t-shirt under a camouflage jacket. She zeroed in on me and gave me an evil sneer. She reminded me of Nancy Bobafit, though the camper girl was much bigger and tougher looking, and her hair was long and stringy, and brown instead of red. I kept walking, trying to steer clear of Chiron's hooves. We haven't seen any other centaurs, I observed. No, said Chiron, sadly. My kinsmen are a wild and barbaric folk. I'm afraid. You might encounter them in the wilderness or at major sporting sporting events, but you won't see any here. You said your name was Chiron. Are you really? He smiled down at me. The Chiron from the stories? Trainer of Hercules and all that? Yes, Percy, I am. But shouldn't you be dead? Chiron paused, as if the question intrigued him. I honestly don't know about, should be. The truth is, I can't be dead. You see, eons ago, the gods granted my wish. I could continue the work I loved. I could be a teacher of heroes as long as humanity needed me. 
I gained much from that wish, and I gave up much, but I'm still here. So I can only assume I'm still needed. I thought about being a teacher for 3,000 years. It wouldn't have made my top 10 things to wish for list. Doesn't it ever get boring? No, no, he said. Horribly depressing at times, but never boring. Why depressing? Chiron seemed to turn hard of hearing again. Oh, look, he said. Annabeth is waiting for us. The blonde girl I'd met at the big house was reading a book in front of the last cabin on the left, number 11. When we'd reached her, she looked over at me critically, like she was still thinking about how much I drooled. I tried to see what she was reading, but I couldn't make out the title. I thought my dyslexia was acting up. Then I realized the title wasn't even English. The letters looked Greek to me. I mean, literally Greek. There were pictures of temples and statues and different kinds of columns, like those in the architectural book. Annabeth, Chiron said, I have a master's archery class at noon. Would you take Percy from here? Yes, sir. Cabin 11. Chiron told me, gesturing toward the doorway. Make yourself at home. Out of all the cabins, Eleven looked the most like a regular old summer camp cabin, with the emphasis on old. The threshold was worn down, the brown paint peeling. Over the doorway was one of those doctor symbols, a winged pole with two snakes wrapped around it. What did they call it? A uh, caduceus? Inside, it was packed with people, both boys and girls. Way more than the number of bunk beds. Sleeping beds were spread all over the floor. It looked like a gym where the Red Cross had set up an evacuation center. Chiron didn't go in. The door was too low for him. But when the campers saw him, they all stood and bowed respectfully. Wilden. Chiron said. Good luck, Percy. I'll see you at dinner. He galloped away toward the archery range. I stood in the doorway, looking at the kids. They weren't bowing anymore. They were staring at me, sizing me up. I knew this routine. I'd gone through it at enough schools. Well, Annabeth prompted, go on. So I naturally tripped coming in the door and made a total fool of myself. There were some snickers from the campers, but none of them said anything. Annabeth announced, Percy Jackson, meet cabin 11. Regular or undetermined? Someone asked. I didn't know what to say, but Annabeth said, undetermined. Everybody groaned. A guy who was a little older than the rest came forward. Now, now, campers, that's what we're here for. Welcome, Percy. You can have that spot on the floor, right over there. The guy was about 19, and he looked pretty cool. He was tall and muscular, with short, cropped, sandy hair and a friendly smile. He wore an orange tank top, cutoffs, sandals, and a leather necklace with five different colored clay beads. The only thing unsettling about his appearance was a thick white scar that ran from just beneath his right eye to his jaw, like an old knife slash. This is Luke, Annabeth said, and her voice sounded different somehow. I glanced over and couldn't could have sworn she was blushing. She saw me looking, and her expression hardened again. He's your counselor for now. For now? I asked. You are undetermined, Luke explained patiently. They don't know what cabin to put you in, so you're here. Cabin 11 takes all newcomers, all visitors. Naturally, we would. Hermes, our patron, is the god of travelers. I looked at the tiny section of floor they'd given me. I had nothing to put there to mark it as my own. No luggage, no clothes, no sleeping bag. Just the minotaurs, 
horn. I thought about setting that down, but then I remembered that Hermes was also the god of thieves. I looked around at the campers' faces, some sullen and suspicious, some grinning stupidly, some eyeing me as if they were waiting for a chance to pick my pockets. How long will I be here? I asked. Good question, Luke said. Until you're determined. How long will that take? The campers all laughed. Come on, Annabeth told me. I'll show you the volleyball court. I've already seen it. Come on. She grabbed my wrist and dragged me outside. I could hear the kids of cabin 11 laughing behind me. When we were a few feet away, Annabeth said, Jackson, you have to do better than that. What? She rolled her eyes and mumbled under her breath. I can't believe I thought you were the one. What's your problem? I was getting angry now. All I know is, I kill some bull guy. Don't talk like that, Annabeth told me. You know how many kids at this camp wish they'd had your chance to get killed? To fight the Minotaur. What do you think we train for? I shook my head. Look, if the thing I fought really was the Minotaur, the same one in the stories. Yes. Then there's only one? Yes. And he died like a gajillion years ago, right? Theseus killed him in the labyrinth. So? Monsters don't die, Percy. They can be killed, but they don't die. Oh, thanks. That clears it up. They don't have souls like you and me. You can dispel them for a while, maybe even for a whole lifetime if you're lucky. But they are primal forces. Chiron calls them archetypes. Eventually, they reform. I thought about Mrs. Dodds. You mean if I killed one accidentally with a sword? The Fuhrer, I mean your math teacher. That's right. She's still out there. You just made her very, very mad. How did you know about Mrs. Dodds? You talk in your sleep. You almost called her something, a fury. They're Hades torturers, right? Annabeth glanced nervously at the ground, as if she expected it to open up and swallow her. You shouldn't call them by name, even here. We call them the kindly ones, if we have to speak of them at all. Look, is there anything we can say without it thundering? I sounded whiny, even to myself. But right then, I didn't care. Why do I have to stay in cabin 11 anyway? Why is everybody so crowded together? There are plenty of empty bunks right over there. I pointed to the first few cabins, and Annabeth turned pale. You just don't choose a cabin, Percy. It depends on who your parents are or your parent. She stared at me, waiting for me to get in. My mom is Sally Jackson, I said. She works at the candy store in Grand Central Station. At least, she used to. I'm sorry about your mom, Percy, but that's not what I mean. I'm talking about your other parent, your dad. He's dead. I never knew him. Annabeth sighed. Clearly, she'd had this conversation before with other kids. Your father is not dead, Percy. How can you say that? You know him? No, of course not. Then how can you say? Because I know you. You wouldn't be here if you weren't one of us. You don't know anything about me. No? She raised an eyebrow. I bet you moved around from school to school. I bet you were kicked out of a lot of them. This is going to be a very touching moment between Annabeth and Percy. They are actually talking about some similar problems that they had, and Percy is probably thinking, uh, you know, how does this happen? Why? But let's read on to hear more. How? Diagnosed with dyslexia, 
probably ADHD too. I tried to swallow my embarrassment. What does that have to do with anything? Taken together, it's almost a sure sign. The letters float off the page when you read, right? That's because your mind is hardwired for ancient Greek. And the ADHD, your impulsive. Can't sit still in the classroom. That's your battlefield reflexes. In a real fight, they keep you alive. As for the attention problems, that's because you see too much, Percy, not too little. Your senses are better than a regular mortal's. Of course, the teachers want you medicated. Most of them are monsters. They don't want you seeing them for what they are. You sound like you went through the same thing. Most of the kids here did. If you weren't like us, you couldn't have survived the Minotaur, much less the Ambrosia and Nectar. Ambrosia and Nectar? The food and drink we were giving you to make you better. That stuff would have killed a normal kid. It would have turned your blood to fire and your bones to sand, and you'd be dead. Face it, you're a half-blood. A half-blood. I was reeling with so many questions, I didn't know where to start. Then a husky voice yelled, Well, newbie! I looked over. The big girl from the ugly red cabin was sauntering towards us. She had three other girls behind her, all big and ugly and mean looking like her all wearing camo jackets. Clarice, Annabeth sighed. Why don't you go polish your spear or something? Sure, Miss Princess, the big girl said. So I can run you through with it Friday night. Eres Caracas, Annabeth said, which I somehow understood was Greek for go to the crows, though I had a feeling it was a worse curse than it sounded. You don't stand a chance. We'll pulverize you, Clarice said, but her eye twitched. Perhaps she wasn't sure she could follow through on the threat. She turned toward me. Who's this little runt? Percy Jackson, Annabeth said. Meet Clarice, daughter of Ares. I blinked. Like the war god? Clarice sneered. You got a problem with that? No, I said, recovering my wits. It explains the bad smell. Clarice growled. We got an initiation ceremony for newbies, Prissy. Percy. Whatever. Come on, I'll show you. Clarice, Annabeth tried to say. Stay out of it, wise girl. Annabeth looked pained, but she did stay out of it, and I didn't really want her help. I was the new kid. I had to earn my own rep. I handed Annabeth my minotaur horn and got ready to fight. But before I knew it, Clarice had me by the neck and was dragging me toward a cinder block building that I knew immediately was the bathroom. I was kicking and punching. I'd been in plenty of fights before, but this big girl Clarice had hands like iron. She dragged me into the girl's bathroom. There was a line of toilets on one side, and a line of shower stalls down the other. It smelled just like any other public bathroom. And I was thinking, as much as I could think with Clarice ripping my hair out, that if this place belonged to the gods, they should have been able to afford classier johns. Clarice's friends were all laughing, and I was trying to find the strength I'd used to fight the Minotaur, but it just wasn't there. Like he's big three material. Clarice said as she pushed me toward one of the toilets. Yeah, right. Minotaur probably fell over laughing. He was so stupid looking. Her friend snickered. Annabeth stood in the corner, watching through her fingers. Clarice bent me over on my knees and started pushing my head toward the toilet bowl. It reeked like rusted pipes and, well, like what goes into toilets. I strained to keep my head up. I was looking at the scummy water, thinking, I will not go into that. I won't. Then something happened. I felt a tug in the pit of my stomach. I heard the plumbing rumble, the pipes shudder. Clarice's grip 
of my hair loosened. Water shot out of the toilet, making an arc straight over my head. And the next thing I knew, I was sprawled on the bathroom tiles with Clarice screaming behind me. I turned just as the water blasted out of the toilet again, hitting Clarice straight in the face so hard it pushed her down onto her butt. The water stayed on her like the spray of a fire hose, pushing her backward into the shower stall. She struggled, gasping, and her friends started coming toward her. But then the other toilets exploded too, and six more streams of toilet water blasted them back. The showers acted up too, and together, all the fixtures sprayed the camouflage girls right out of the bathroom, spinning them around like pieces of garbage being washed away. As soon as they were out the door, I felt the tug in my gut bless it, and the water shut off as quickly as it had started. The entire bathroom was flooded. Annabeth hadn't been spared. She was dripping wet, but she hadn't been pushed out the door. She was standing in exactly the same place, staring at me in shock. I looked down and realized I was sitting in the only dry spot in the whole room. There was a circle of dry floor around me. I didn't have one drop of water on my clothes. Nothing. I stood up, my legs shaky. Annabeth said, How did you? I don't know. We walked to the door. Outside, Clarice and her friends were sprawled in the mud, and a bunch of other campers had gathered around to gawk. Clarice's hair was flattened across her face. Her camouflaged jacket was sopping, and she smelled like sewage. She gave me a look of absolute hatred. You are dead, new boy. You are totally dead. I probably should have let it go, but I said, You want to gargle with toilet water again, Clarice? Close your mouth. Her friends had to hold her back. They dragged her toward cabin five, while the other campers made way to avoid her flailing feet. Annabeth stared at me. I couldn't tell whether she was just grossed out or angry at me for dousing her. What? I demanded. What are you thinking? I'm thinking, she said that I want you on my team for Capture the Flag. 